Hello, Hello. Welcome, welcome back. back. Um, I, hope um, I hope you are all appropriately, appropriately caffeinated. caffeinated. Um, and my name is my Carly Patton. I'm the I'm policy, the director, policy here director here at OK, at OK, policy. OK policy. I'm also the I'm recovering, the recovering healthcare, healthcare policy, policy analyst. analyst. And, I'm, and really I'm really delighted that you're all here you're for, all here for our, panel. our panel. Um, um we've <laughs> got Senator Thompson, the appropriations chair, um, also on finance and roles. Um, representing uh, Okamulgee, McIntosh, Ofusky, and Muskogee counties uh, elected in 2014. Um, we've asked all our panelists to put together a short opening statement before we go to getting questions. And Senator Thompson, we'll start with you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, certainly glad to be with you today. And uh, uh, thank you for having me a part of the summit. As my introduction, I've been uh, elected in 2014, my first year, 2015. And uh, I own businesses with my wife in Okima. We have a newspaper, uh, flower shop, office supply, and, and uh, we have rental properties. So uh, in the Senate, I've been appropriations chair. This will be my third year uh, going in uh, to the appropriations process. And as many of you know, it's gonna be a, a different year coming out of uh, the pandemic and uh, still working through some issues with the pandemic. So hopefully during the day that we'll be able to talk a little bit about some of our revenue streams and what we look at for this next year. I've looked over some of the questions, but uh, I look forward to being with you today and uh, taking part in the panel discussion. We'll go now to Senator Kurt. Um, she serves on appropriations and uh, finance as well as a few other committees. Um, Senator Kurt was elected in 2018. Morning, I'm so glad to be here. Um, the last four or five years I've been watching and learning. Um, so I so much appreciate this budget summit each year. I, we enter such an important time. I mean, everything has changed with COVID and we really have to look at how we rebuild our economy and our state in ways that are more sustainable and that don't leave so many people behind. So I look forward to the conversation. The budget is such a combination of the details and the weeds as well as the big picture and our aspirations. So I, I look for the opportunity to speak about that and certainly glad to serve on this panel with Senator Thompson, who uh, welcomes new legislators into understanding the budget and trying to get a better uh, sense of how it all works and um, has been crucial to me getting to where I have officially become a budget nerd. So thanks for having me. This is the place for budget nerds. <laughs> Thank you, Senator. Um, we go now to Representative Munson. Um, she was elected in 2015, representing parts of Oklahoma City. Uh, Representative Munson, take it away. And I want to note. Uh, Thank you, Carly. Thank you so much. Oh. There is a bit of delay on my, my end here. So I just want to make note of that before I get started. Um, first, want to say thank you to you, Carly, and thank you to Oklahoma Policy uh, Institute for having me. I'm uh, really excited to join you all. Um, like Senator Kurt said, I have always enjoyed attending these budget conversations before session, um, not only as an elected official, but um, as I was running for office and before I was running for office, I, I gleaned a lot of information from you all on the work I was doing. Um, in the nonprofit sector as I worked for the Girl Scouts of Western Oklahoma on behalf of girls across 39 counties in Western Oklahoma, as well as their families. And I was really pushed to run for uh, the House of Representatives because of um, how I felt about the underfunding of our schools and critical services that uh, we will discuss, I know, today and as we go along throughout session. Um, just to give you a little bit of uh, background about me, as Carly mentioned, I was elected in a special election in 2015, so I'm entering my sixth legislative session. I serve the House Democratic Caucus as caucus chair and look forward to that role in this upcoming session in this legislature. And as I mentioned, prior prior to uh, running for office, I worked in the nonprofit sector. So I feel really passionate about uh, making sure our nonprofit organizations and advocates are speaking up on the issues that are so important to uh, Oklahomans, because we are on the ground providing those services and filling the gaps when government so often uh, doesn't do its part in serving uh, residents across our state. I also serve on the House uh, full A and B committee, so the Appropriation and Budget Committee in the House. I will be um, 
on this committee, this will be my second session that I'll be on the full house A and B committee. So I look forward to that work. It's, it's tough work. Uh, we're always very busy. There's always a lot of bills to get through, um, but feel really grateful to be a part of that process um, in that capacity. And of course, um, as a legislator. So I look forward to the conversations that we'll have today and just wanna thank you again uh, for having us. Thank you, Carly. Thank you, Representative Munson. Uh, and I was going to mention, uh, we ask for the audience's patience on the tech front. We've got five different Wi-Fi systems all struggling to do their jobs right now. Um, so hopefully they will all hang in there for the duration of the panel. Um, and Representative, I'm glad you mentioned the Girl Scouts because I believe Girl Scout cookie season has just started and I have some orders to place. Um, finally, I'm delighted to welcome uh, Tara Branson Thomas, Secretary of Nation and Commerce for the Muskogee Creek Nation. Um, Tara. Hi, good morning, uh, and thank you for the invitation, and thanks for hosting uh, this very important discussion. Um, I am really just honored to be on the panel with folks uh, from the state who are making very important decisions and uh, really leading the state in some of these very um, nerdy topics, as I think has already been alluded to. Um, tribal nations in the state of Oklahoma uh, are critical um, to the success of the state and we share when the state does well and we um, pull together when the state needs additional support or um, help in our communities and local municipal governments. And so I, it's just a pleasure to be a part of the discussion and to hear from some of the smartest folks on these issues and to field questions uh, as we enter into another legislative session. Uh, and I appreciate the opportunity. Um, I've been with Muskogee Creek Nation for nearly four years now. And prior to that, I also worked in the nonprofit space doing advocacy um, primarily at the federal level for tribal governments. And so while I'm not um, as a as a expert as others on the panel uh, here in the state of Oklahoma, I do understand how tribes contribute to local economies and how we can continue to provide support um, and help in uh, local and rural areas here in the state of Oklahoma. So I'm really uh, happy to be a part of the panel and look forward to the discussion. Thanks, Carly. Um, and audience, please be dropping questions into the chats or comments or however it's done on the various platforms on which you are watching. Oh yes, just there. Um, I'm gonna start off with uh, one uh, directed at Senator Thompson, other panelists, if you want to jump in, please just gesture and our comments will slot you up. Um, so starting off, the COVID-19 pandemic um, will continue to threaten our health and food security and incomes for the coming year and full economic recovery will probably take years. Um, what should we do this legislative session um, to improve both our short and long-term response? Question uh, very much and um, certainly looking forward to the coming session. Um, as you know, we've had a uh, two different packages from the federal government that has really had an impact on our uh, first uh, introduction, our introduction to the pandemic. You know, the, the feds did 2.2 trillion uh, on the first round. And uh, as I looked at those numbers last year, that tracked right along uh, with Oklahoma. And uh, so whenever I was standing up and saying that cutting the budget 1.3 billion was a, a little too much, I think it was probably between five and 600 billion uh, too much, or five or 600 million too much, uh, proves in the Board of Equalization meeting that those figures were true and, and they were accurate. I, I do feel good kind of looking over some of our numbers today. We're down 2% in our sales tax collections, uh, but we're up in our use tax collections, which is our online tax by about 12%. And so that's for a net gain of about $5 million. So while we're down $50 million in sales tax, we're up 5 million uh, or 55 million in, in online tax. Uh, we have other growth indicators that I think are looking good, such as right now on the uh, uh, withholding income tax. So we're in between relief packages. And uh, I'm looking forward to another relief package coming to Oklahoma and helping the folks. But uh, right now we're about up 1%. That means some folks are able to return back to work. And so that looks pretty good for the economy. So the question is, what do we need to be on the lookout for? Uh, reading a current report from the uh, Legislative Office of Fiscal Transparency on the CARES money and uh, how that it was spent, how that we are obligated for the future of some of those uh, expenditures, uh, to making sure that we're able to handle those. Uh, the testing is somewhat a very much concern of mine. 
Uh, I, don't, I do not want to see people having to go back to their pocketbooks to pay for testing. I think it's something the state's going to look at. So the second round of CARES money uh, will be a part of that. So uh, the impact on the budget this year, uh, the uh, great part of it's going to be for the uh, Medicaid expansion. We may get into that just a little bit later on and uh, talk about the impact that's going to have on, on the budget as we move forward. So that's just kind of a, a quick overview. Fantastic. Thank you, Senator. Uh, yeah, Senator Kurt. Well, I just want to hop in there and say absolutely we're reliant on the federal level packages that can come out. Um, certainly has boosted our budget this year and kept us in better shape. We want to make sure we're taking advantage of any of those federal programs that are offered to us. Um, you know, the extended unemployment. Um, we really have to get that help to our people. And we're still, you know, working through some of the folks who've had technology challenges or adjudication from the first round of unemployment. So we've got to make sure people are getting those benefits in their pocket. Um, you know, short term, the things we could do very quickly, certainly the refundability of the of the earned income tax credit, we can even make that retrospective to 2020, which, which give people a boost um, directly from the state. Um, increasing the minimum wage would help across the state um, with increasing our, our GDP and our benefits through access to health care. That's going to help our workforce. That's going to improve our economic development. We have to make sure people are healthy. Um, that means protection from COVID, taking every precaution we can, but that also means getting people the help they need um, for all their other health, um, making sure we're taking care of mental health crisis, making sure we're preventing mental health crisis. Those things are going to save our state money, but they're also going to have those wonderful human benefits um, and allow people to, to rebuild their lives. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Um, and I would love to stay on that question for the entire hour, but I've been informed that much like Paul couldn't take six or seven hours of questions, I can't take an entire hour on one question, apparently. So for our next one, and I'd be I'd like um, be well, I'd be delighted to see any of you and all of you jump on this one. Um, as Paul mentioned, Oklahoma's tax structure has become one of the most unfair in the country for low-income people, um, requiring low-income Oklahomans to pay a greater share of their income in taxes than high earners, and by a greater margin than most states. Um, how should Oklahoma address that? If, if we're going to be silent, let me just go ahead and open up. Uh, I think that we need to continue to look at our, our tax structure uh, in Oklahoma. Uh, one of the, the areas that we must be able to do is to fund uh, our core services. And whenever I was chair of finance, I, I looked at updating our tax code and working on it. Uh, there are a couple of areas that are very problematic for that. State question 640 is one of those areas. Uh, we have to have a 75% vote uh, from the legislature. Uh, to have any new taxes. And so if we're able to get into our tax code and tax maybe some things we don't tax today, and uh, that, that would help individuals uh, because we could actually lower our base tax for the state uh, if we're able to spread that out over whether it be services or wherever it's going to be. You know, doing away with the idea of uh, grocery tax. Uh, is, I've been a proponent of that for a while, but we've got to replace that. And uh, certainly for a lot of our small communities who are uh, that probably their biggest income within our community are grocery stores. And so I think state question 640 is going to challenge us uh, in doing that. And then, of course, it's hard to put together an entire package of either tax reform uh, whenever that we have the single subject rule. And so both of those present challenges. I don't think they're overwhelming challenges, just something that I'm uh, committed to working through and still working on some of it. Fantastic. Thank you, Senator. Um, looking for anyone else to respond. Senator? Uh, well, I just want to add, add a little bit more to what Senator Thompson's talking about. I one of the challenges with the way we've structured a lot of our tax incentives, tax credits, um, we have focused on specific industries. And um, I heard an economist say once, um, if, this, if we're relying on the state government to uh, uh, project the future of our industries and economy, we're going to be behind. And so one of the things I would like to see is an improved neutral approach to any incentives or deductions so that they're not industry specific, because by the time we've passed something and put it into place, it's likely not avant garde across the country. And so for our state to lead, we really have to look at broad based opportunities, um, kind of like our education. We want to make sure that we're building kids 
options for the future and that we're not um, narrowly focusing them in things that may not be jobs in the future. Um, so I think investing in our small startup businesses, I've been meeting with some micro businesses lately, those folks who employ five or fewer employees, and they're in a very different boat than our big businesses. I mean, if we can empower people to become self-employed, you know, that's in Oklahoma spirit. Uh, Oklahomans are self-employed at a higher rate. And we should be looking at how to empower people in that. One question from the uh, chat or from the comments. Um, Senator Thompson mentioned looking forward to Medicaid expansion. Uh, I personally am also looking forward to Medicaid expansion because it has been uh, a significant part of my job for my entire time at OK Policy. Um, and I'm looking forward to hundreds of thousands of Oklahomans getting the care that they need. Um, it's my understanding that the health care authority is voting today on part of a managed care piece. Um, can you talk a little bit how you foresee the governor's plan to outsource Medicaid expansion will progress? I, uh, I'd rather allow the governor to speak for himself on his managed care program. And um, I, I do know that I am concerned about some of the areas of managed care in rural Oklahoma. Uh, some of that is going to be for transportation and uh, our, whether it be your transit companies, it'll have to, every one of them will have to compact with managed care companies to be able to get people to the doctor. And I am very, very concerned about that. Uh, the other area is some of our local dentists, our local pharmacy, our local medical supply people um, that are now really hooked into the Medicaid and do a fantastic job. Uh, they also provide a lot of employment in the area. And so I'm, I'm concerned. Will the managed care companies be going out of state and bringing people into state? And I'm working uh, as hard as I can with the managed care companies I can meet with to make sure that's not going to be the case. The overall cost of, of Medicaid expansion to the state budget, uh, a minimum of $164.8 million uh, annually. It could go as high as $246 million, depending on how many people we're serving. Uh, so part of my job this year is going to say, how do we come up with this money? I'm not interested in using one-time funds uh, to pay for it. It's an ongoing expense. I think that's very unwise. And uh, right now we've had an enhanced FMAP and uh, that has led us to about a $217 million uh, surplus at the healthcare authority. And so people would say, well, we've got enough money to pay for it for one year. Uh, that's not wise on my part uh, to do use one-time money. Also, we're going to have a $50 million bubble payment if we're able to go to managed care. And I, I just want to say the legislature will be discussing this uh, very much this year. And I think it'll be one, probably one of the greatest discussions we'll have and, and the most heated discussion we'll have uh, in the legislature that kicks off next week. But if we go to managed care, it'll be about a $50 million bubble because we just can't stop paying people that are on pay for service and then start paying the managed care companies uh, to be able to take care. And so we have a lot of things that are before us, a lot of things that are yet to be decided by the legislature. And uh, but that is going to be a great challenge. I do want to say before I conclude, I've been for Medicaid expansion since I have been elected. Uh, I think we've needed it. Anytime we get federal money, we ought to be taking some of the federal money. I am concerned because it's in our Constitution and uh, that the expense will become a, a priority expense. And so I've been working the numbers back and forth to make sure that we're not having to, to look at any other service reductions that we can pay for Medicaid expansion. Fantastic. Thank you, Senator. And I, I'm well aware that you've been for Medicaid expansion and really, really appreciate your advocacy on that front. Um, any, uh, any other panelists want to, um, want to also respond to that question? Representative Munson, looks like you've unmuted. Yeah, well, first, I want to thank Senator Thompson for his support of Medicaid expansion. I think it's important for um, Oklahomans to understand that Medicaid expansion should not be a partisan issue, that this is something that we as, uh, you know, state leaders should be working towards and should have um, for many years. And um, I'm certainly grateful for those who um, took it upon themselves, especially the people, to um, ensure that their voices were heard and, um put a mandate on us to fund healthcare in Oklahoma. And I think our priority um, should be making sure that we answer the will of the people. So um, I think I missed a part of that because of the lag in my Wi-Fi, but I, I know that managed care was brought up and I think that we have to focus on uh, ensuring that we pay for, uh, we fund Medicaid to ensure that folks have access to 
healthcare. And uh, similar to what Senator Thompson said, and what I wanted to add to the question about our, our tax structure is that we can't continue um, having these short-sighted plans or one-time uh, funding streams when we have uh, services that we have to continue to fund that are so critical to the health and welfare of our citizens, uh, especially when it comes to health care. Um, we know that now more than ever with the ongoing pandemic that we are navigating and living through, um, the pandemic only exasperated the health challenges that we face here in Oklahoma, especially when it comes to mental health and behavioral health um, and those services that have been underfunded for so long. Um, just today, I was listening to a story about the increase um, in suicide deaths um, that the CDC has reported. And uh, while they didn't delve into each state, I know that Oklahoma is probably uh, one of the highest just because of the underfunding and, and lack of focus that we've had on healthcare. And so um, with this session, it is important for us to work together on both sides of the aisle and, and ensuring that we fund uh, Medicaid without, have we don't have to have um, also that short side solution that services have to be pitted against each other. So I know in uh, Paul Shin's uh, conversation about, uh, or his presentation about the budget, there was a question about educa education being cut in order to fund healthcare. Um, and to me, that's such a short-sighted way to plan uh, for our future. It's a short-sighted way to plan for our budget this year um, when we can really uh, find ways and work together to fund our critical services without choosing between uh, education or healthcare um, or other economic safeguards that we should be focused on this session and, and sessions in the future. Thank you, Representative Munson. I'm really glad you brought that up. The, uh, the half joke that I've been making since uh, very late June um, has been that um, uh, when Oklahoma voted to pass Medicaid expansion, they didn't vote to trade kindergarten for healthcare, right? They voted for a better Oklahoma for Oklahomans. Um, and I'm really looking forward to um, how the legislature tackles that this session and ongoing. Um, I'm gonna zoom out a little bit to more of a philosophical question. Um, you can't talk about budget and taxes in Oklahoma um, without bringing the relationship between the state government and our tribal nations into discussion. Um, how do those relationships affect you all the way it affect how do these relationships affect the way you all approach questions of revenue sufficiency and tax fairness? Um, and Secretary Brenton Thomas, I'd like to start with you. Sure. Thank you for uh, posing the question. We uh, at Muskogee Creek Nation have been looking at ways to continue to provide support to our reservation and to the state in total. Um, I think that the question is is a delicate delicate one, and that we um, have positioned ourselves in the state of Oklahoma um, so that maybe we're not always on the same side. However, um, tribal citizens that live on the reservation are Oklahoma citizens as well, and the Muscogee Creek Nation Constitution protects their rights as a state as a state uh, citizen. So any right that they have as an Oklahoma citizen is protected by our Constitution and cannot be. Um, deterred. And so I think one of the one of the issues that has come up recently in the media is around the Oklahoma Tax Commission's uh, report that extends um, some ideas around uh, the McGirt decision to civil implications that include tax collection and state um, individual income tax uh, exemptions. And so we've been working internally to provide support to tribal citizens to better understand what their new rights are, how the Oklahoma law reads. And I've reached out to several um, elected representatives to kind of talk about what the intent is um, coming up uh, in the next legislative session. And I've heeded the calls uh, from Governor Stitt uh, to participate in in-person meetings to talk about potential opportunities on the horizon where states and uh, where the state and tribe can come together uh, and potentially negotiate some uh, uh, ideas that work for both entities. I think the challenge for tribal nations is that we carry a similar responsibility to the state of Oklahoma. Uh, we have to provide uh, public services in our communities uh, and the McGirt decision reaffirmed that responsibility. So we too are in a position where we're trying to identify potential revenue opportunities um, and <clears throat> really are handicapped by federal law um, and how we can uh, generate revenue, uh, which is very different than the state of Oklahoma. And so 
So while we want to be partners in the success of the state of Oklahoma, we also recognize that we have a responsibility um, to provide services to our citizens and other tribal citizens who live within our nation. Um, while McGirt is a Muscogee Creek specific decision, um, it implicates any tribal citizens that live within our reservation, including um, the vast majority of Tulsa. And so we take that responsibility seriously. Um, it uh, impacts our ability to provide public safety, transportation, housing, um, and other you know significant public services that tribes are responsible for providing to tribal citizens. So. Um, we want to work in partnership with the state of Oklahoma. We want to find solutions that work for everyone, uh, for all Oklahomans, including tribal citizens. So uh, it is a complex discussion. There are lots of questions, lots of opportunities and lots of challenges, uh, but nothing that I don't think that a little bit of, uh, you know, elbow grease and uh, some good wonks uh, can't fix. So we're really excited about that opportunity and look forward to those discussions in the future. I'm going to add elbow grease and wonk to the if I didn't mention as long as I have a captive audience of however many people are watching on various platforms. OK, policy um, in conjunction with the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities is currently uh, hiring for a tribal fellow um, to help tackle some of the uh, particularly thorny issues um, or exciting issues raised by McGirt. Um, as well as so many other ways that state and tribal policy interact. Um, and Senator Kurt, I saw your hand. Thank you. I'll uh, jump in here because I know Senator Thompson has the details, um, but I want to just talk about the big picture a little bit is that, um, you know, clearly we need to approach our partnership with the tribal nations with more respect and more recognition of their sovereign um, status and that every uh, partnership we enter into, we should begin with that kind of partnership and mutual respect. Um, I wanna see us doing a better job of learning from tribal nations, how they have um, diversified their economies. Um, you know, We have some incredible success stories in rural Oklahoma of tribes um, bringing economic development, building up their own economies, um, focusing on the assets they have in their communities. So be that their artists, their culture, their place, their um, natural resources, and using that to build their economies. So I want us to, to learn from their, their growth as well as look towards our future financially. And Senator Thompson, uh, I believe Senator Kurt has, uh, has sort of queued you up. So um, anything else you'd like to add? Uh, yes. Uh, Madam Secretary, thank you for being a part of this discussion today with the Muscogee Creek Nation. Um, I had great visits with Chief Hill, and uh, I count him as a, a friend of mine. Uh, right after the McGirt decision came down, I made an appointment and I drove to Okmulgee, and we sat down and we visited. Uh, he hosted a seminar for state legislators uh, in Tulsa and uh, did a great job. Chief Hill made it uh, apparent that whatever decisions that we make, we need to move slowly because the decisions that are made today uh, will impact generations uh, to come. There, there are some, some challenges behind McGirt. And uh, some of those are going to be uh, the Oklahoma Tax Commission report. Uh, we, we need to work through it, as the, uh, the secretary made mention. If we take all five tribes, and in the report it talks about it could have a, a potential impact uh, on the state budget of $200 million a year, if all five civilized tribes exercise their right on income tax and on sales tax. Now, the income tax is uh, working its way through the system. Uh, I think there'll be some challenges of paying income tax this year because the McGirt kind of broadened that from trust land into reservation land. And uh, so we don't look at any uh, significant impact this year. There may be more next year uh, on the budget. Uh, I do believe that we need sales tax compacts uh, with the tribe. Um, we've, we've got several issues in small communities that live off of sales tax alone, and we need that. I know in Omogi, we still have a strip mall that we need some sort of a compact on and work on. Uh, we deal with our civil cases. We deal with law enforcement. Uh, there are still some law enforcement that have not uh, yet reached an agreement on uh, being able to cross deputize. Uh, I think that's imperative uh, that they do that, encouraging all the law enforcement to do it. I do have a group of individuals now in uh, the Senate district. And by the way, my entire Senate district lies within the Muscogee Creek Reservation. And except for just one little small part in Muscogee County that's on the Cherokee uh, Reservation. And so I am confronted with questions every day. 
but I've got a group in McIntosh County that are Native Americans living on uh, the reservation now, uh, by the definition of McGirt, who are seeking not to pay property taxes. And uh, whenever I talked to Chief Hill about it, he said that, you know, he didn't have, he was agnostic about it, was encouraging people to pay their taxes, that they are uh, a part of the community. But we realize if we start not paying property taxes, and that has to go through the court system, uh, that doesn't hit the state. The state does not have a property tax. That hits the local communities and, and your county government and your schools and could be impacted. I don't know where that's going to go. I've been having that discussion for some time uh, with this group. And uh, so I, I think that is going to be a growing uh, discussion for, for taxation. I, I do believe that we need to have uh, leader to leader uh, consultation. I've been for the governor sitting down with the chiefs and the governors and the tribal leaders and, and come to an agreement. Uh, I am not for raising the exclusivity fees uh, for tribes. As I told the governor, whenever we started all of this, if you look in my district, uh, that only have one hospital in my district, and that's in Henrietta, that's not native owned. And uh, we would not have health care if it were not for uh, the Muscogee Creek Nation in the majority of communities uh, within my district. And so very much so. The gymnasiums that are built at the school, the roads that are built in the town, uh, the tribes are great economic partners with us, and we need to sit down and, and say, hey, we value what we have. Uh, but how do we get to the next level? And that's where I see today that we're we're missing the next step, that we're going to be able to sit down and say, we need to be working on compacts. And so I am concerned about it uh, on the state level. I'm also very much concerned about it on the small community level, uh, especially whenever we're dealing with sales tax and property taxes. Thank you, uh, Senator Thompson. Um, getting back into the weeds, uh, another question. Um, and I think this is directed at Senators Thompson and Kurt. Um, where are we in the process of allocating the 781 funding for drug and alcohol treatment that voters passed in 2016? Follow. Um, I thank you very much. And, and I'll kick it to Senator Kurt very quickly. You know, it's been hard for us to quantify uh, the savings of 781. Uh, we had in the last administration, uh, OMES came up with a calculation of just taking all of the cases that have been filed across the state and uh, worked out a formula. Uh, so we've had discussions in the interim about how much money that we would look at to put back into 781. Uh, but as of today, there's been no deposit uh, put into that particular account. I do think it's imperative that we begin to quantify that in the very near future and get back into programs. One of the challenges that we've had on uh, some of the programs that are being used, like for drug addiction and some others, again, whenever that we uh, passed 780 and so many of the drug convictions changed from felony and misdemeanors. I'm, I'm not saying that's a bad deal, but whenever it began to happen, so our mental health courts and uh, our drug courts are seeing a a diminished population coming into them. I was on the phone with the judge the other day in, in Seminole County and they're struggling even with keeping the drug court open because how do we get people into those drug courts? So is there a need? Absolutely. We need to quantify the amount and we need to look to see how we're going to fund it. So Senator Kirk, over to you. Like maybe that was a setup because Senator Thompson's most likely to have the, the actual backstory on where we are with numbers. But I think that's the, one of the challenges when working through um, the will of the people and um, the details of our budget is um, defining what savings are. Um, you know, we've underfunded our correction system for many years, not to mention our prevention um, opportunities. Um, so when you take a very underfunded Department of Corrections that's bare bones, um, some would even say substandard in terms of how we're able to take care of the Oklahomans who are incarcerated, um, it's pretty hard to quantify effectively. If we increase their budget, does that mean um, the amount uh, for 781 goes up? I think that this is all being negotiated and I wish it was clearer. Um, certainly we need to be investing more at the local level in diversion and other opportunities, um, but I, it will be a, a negotiated item on, ongoing. Your advocacy doesn't stop with the state question is what I should say. Absolutely. I'm glad you uh, mentioned that as well. I know when Medicaid expansion passed, I remember being on the phone with some other advocates and saying, okay, so now we just need to do it. Oh boy. And then we took a nap. 
Thank you uh, very much, uh, Senators. Um, here's a somewhat more general question that I've thrown out so far. What do we foresee for school funding? Uh, thank you. I, uh, as we look at education for this next year, you know, you made a comment early on that we don't want to trade uh, kindergarten for healthcare. That's never been a discussion uh, that I've been a part of, nor would I want to be a part of that. And, um, you know, we uh, looked at last year whenever that we had to take some cuts, and we talked about that early in the program. Education only ended up with about a 2.86% cut, which was significant. It was a little over $88 million. Uh, we're hoping this year that we can restore uh, that money and get us back to the FY20 appropriation for common education, uh, just a little over $3 billion. Uh, education, because of CARES money, uh, there's been a lot of money that's flowed in, and especially within my district, because I have a lot of Title I schools. And uh, the, the last round has helped them a great deal. Some of the schools that's not heavy into Title I, that hasn't helped them as much. Uh, but uh, there has been no discussion that I've been a part of that we are cutting any education funding to take care of health care. Now, what kind of money are we going to be looking at uh, coming in? Uh, again, optimistically, I'm looking at a flat budget for this last year and uh, that we can move forward with the increases that we would have, hopefully back to education. And uh, probably we're going to have to take a look at health care and make sure that we have the money for testing as we talked about earlier. Thank you, Senator. And that's something you touched on um, a little bit. Our budget process doesn't currently lend itself uh, easily to long term planning. Um, and I know this is something that the uh, Legislative Office of Fiscal Transparency is working to address. What else specifically can advocates do to help their legislators bring a longer perspective to the budget process? All right. Well, um, I'll Sen shot at this to begin with. Senator, I promise I'm not beating up on you. <laughs> Oh, uh, sure you are, uh, but I don't mind. Uh, so whenever we take a look at the budget process, we do have an annual budget and we have to have a balanced budget annually. And uh, one of the areas that we believe LOF will get to and we're wanting to be there is, is if we take federal funds and uh, what long term uh, obligation does that have to the state? We've had agencies come in before and say, hey, I've got a $10 million grant. It's got a $500,000 match. And, um, and I can pay that out of the, my uh, revolving funds. So it has a zero fiscal impact given to us by the tax commission. And uh, so uh, we say, okay, let's do that. Then come next year, uh, we have a $500,000 obligation for the life of the grant. So we wanna make sure that we're not able to do that. You know, another area that I uh, see in, in legislators just really digging in to the budget. And uh, uh, I wanna pause a moment and I'll tell you what, Senator Kirk has been one of those legislators that have come in, they've grabbed a hold of it, they begin to learn numbers. And even though she and I are on different sides of the aisle, uh, we're not on different sides of a, of, a, of a lot of issues because she's somebody who does her homework and we're able to sit down and really have an intelligent conversation. What, what I have difficulty with is having conversations with people who've not done homework, who've not really looked at the budget and see where we want to be. So how can you help your legislators, encourage them to get involved in the process? And then for the legislators themselves to have long range goals that they're trying to really address something within their time in the legislature. And, uh, you know, 12 years seems like a long time. It begins to be a very short time. I'm in my seventh session. And if I'm fortunate enough to serve all 12, I am uh, more behind me than I have in front of me. And the amazing thing that I have is that I work hard on the budget process, but I learn something new every day, where money's coming from and where it's going. So encourage your legislators, get involved, encourage your legislators to have a vision of where they would like to go during their time here and then work toward uh, bringing that vision to fruition. I was just going to add, um, and of course, anyone else jump in, but just in terms of advocacy, I it can be intimidating to speak up about the budget. I know, you know, even talking to Senator Thompson, who's very welcoming, you know, he knows some of those budget numbers down to the individual dollars um, for, um, you know, a billion dollar budget um, for an agency. Um, so that can be a little intimidating. But as an advocate, if you can focus on how short sighted budgets are impacting you in a real life way, that can be helpful. So if you're seeing things, you know, things that led to Medicaid expansion, like my hospital's closing down, or this is what's happening in our schools, um, that can be effective for helping um, your legislators see what priorities you're asking for and push them towards longer term vision. Um, you don't have to write the budget. I mean, that's the challenge inside the building is doing the actual crunching and putting one thing after another. Um, 
but you can speak up for priorities. And I just have noticed many people are afraid, uh, you know, maybe it's our fear of money in our, in our personal lives or lack of understanding, but afraid of talking about the money. And that is one of the most important parts of what we do. Um, so don't be afraid of the money, step in there and make specific suggestions and that know that, um, you know, Senator Thompson's the one that's going to be waking up at, at 2 a.m. to finish that spreadsheet at, to make it balance out. Um, but you have to speak up for what's important to you. <clears throat> and I believe next we're going to Representative Munson. Thanks, Carly. Uh, I just wanted to echo what uh, both Senator Thompson and Senator Kurtz said about um, legislators getting more involved in the process. I very much appreciate um, the A and B chairs, uh, Senator Thompson, but also Representative Wallace, who um, are really doing the work to engage members of the entire legislature versus just those in the majority and ensuring to include those of us in the minority. Um, because while um, we are in the minority, we do have suggestions and ideas and questions. And it is important for us to understand the process um, and, and to understand the hard work it takes for um, our A and B chairs who, who are ultimately responsible to get that document finished, but also the staff behind them who have been doing the work for a really long time. Um, and I think we ask better questions and we have better dialogue when we are both on the same page or somewhat on the same page and on the same playing field when it comes to that information. Um, in terms of the public getting more involved um, I think sharing your personal stories and, and how the economy has impacted you, not just in times of crisis and things that we're going through today, but, but um, what budget cuts mean to, you know, your child's education or your work environment or the way you do life. That's important for us to hear. And like Senator Kurtz said, it's not always easy to talk about money, especially when you are facing different challenges. But um, every single policy decision that we make trickles down to the people and it and and the biggest decision we make is on that budget bill that we vote on that we have to vote on um, we're constitutionally required to do um, and so I think personal stories and sharing your own lived experiences is, is vital um, I've only had one constituent in my six years of service who has called me and asked me why I voted a certain way on the the budget bill and I was very impressed by her um, willingness and uh, capacity and time to go through the budget bill and ask me some specific questions. And um, what that tells me, only having one person contact me means that that the budget process isn't as transparent as it should be. Uh, we aren't talking about it in a way that is um, understandable for um, everyday Oklahomans to know what it is that we're working on when it comes to the budget. Uh, they just hear about it in the news usually in the month of May. And so um, even we as legislators in our individual districts have to do better about highlighting what it is that we're working on. Um, and something that I wanted to throw out there that's more of a, a bigger picture solution or idea that I think that we should all be ruminating on is term limits. So each of us only serve 12 years. Um, Senator Tom mentioned it in his comments. Um, being at the halfway point in my career, while I, I have experience and certainly feel more confident in other areas um, or, or many areas of my job, there's still so much to learn. And I technically only have six years left. And so um, what happens with term limits is you, you lose that institutional knowledge. You lose the, the folks who have the experience um, and, and the ability to work beyond party lines and really look at the long-term vision and long-term goals of our state. Uh, I think that was a, a short-sighted decision that we as Oklahomans made um, and really should reconsider um, term limits in our state government. And I'm so caught up on these buzzwords like career politician and things like that when we have folks who are truly really knowledgeable in these subject areas who can really help improve the process and ultimately improving the lives of Oklahomans. Thank you, Representative. And I'm really glad that you brought up the term limits piece there. Um, I know that it's heartbreaking uh, to see so much expertise walk out the door every year um, and knowing how hard one that expertise is. 
Um, I'm also glad that you you mentioned, um, actually all of you have mentioned the importance of, of contacting legislators. We'll be talking about this a lot tomorrow during the uh, advocate training and the importance of personal stories um, and being an expert in your own life and being a resource to legislators on that. Um, something that we touched on briefly earlier and I think sort of hangs like a cloud over every legislative session is of course state question 640, which requires the um, supermajority for any revenue raising measures. Um, that's not the only way to put money back into the budget, of course. You can do away with uh, exemptions and incentives with a simple majority. But State Question 640 really has hobbled uh, the legislature's ability um, to raise needed revenues. Do you see any appetite to do away with State Question 640 in the near future or the distant future? You know, I, I strongly believe that's going to have to be from the people. Uh, if you talk to people about legislators, uh, there is a, while people may like their individual legislator, uh, as a whole, uh, our ratings never get really high. And so when we start talking about <laughs> changing 640 and uh, people say, well, they're just after another money grab. And so I think if the people were able to do an initiative petition, I know some of the chambers have looked at it, uh, uh, some of the other groups have looked at it, uh, but I think that's where it would have to, to, to start. Um, we had in a discussion a couple of years ago in the Senate, uh, just simply trying to bring that from 75% down to 60% make it a resolution and get it to the vote of the people. And uh, we were not even able to get that out of uh, committee. And so I think that it's gotta be from the people. Thank you, Senator. Uh, others? Well, certainly uh, for me on the, you know, when talking to people on their doorstep, they, they don't want um, legislators to have more control. Um, so I think it would be a hard sell on a state question, but it's hampering us in many ways. Our lack of flexibility um, to even consider, you know, taxation on new entities, new types of services or the other or other opportunities is so limited. Um, you know, we like to talk a lot about our bond rating from Moody's and they analyze us as a state in terms of our credit. And our lack of flexibility is a big um, uh, red mark for us. Uh, it definitely hampers our ability to look towards the future. It, it, it makes it very difficult to plan from year to year. And, you know, that's the reason why we've only had one uh, real revenue package in, what, 30 years? Um, so I, it's, it's needed, but I think it'd be a very difficult sell and that legislators would not be the best salespeople, as, as Senator Thompson said. Good point. Thank you. Um, and I know something I hear from our criminal justice folks all day long is how inability to raise revenue has increased reliance on fees and fines, which you know are a horribly inefficient way to try to fund absolutely vital systems like like a court system. Um, but that's where uh, state question six forty has has left us. Um, the pandemic revealed some deficits in the tech infrastructure at the OESC, the Employment Security Commission, and the State Health Department. Um, will these issues be addressed during the upcoming legislative session, do you think? Carly, thank you very much. And, and uh, I want to get to your infrastructure at OESC. Uh, when we talk about fees and fines, of course, in times past, I've carried some legislation. Uh, I've chosen not to carry that legislation this year. Uh, we're having to do a supplemental for the courts uh, as soon as we get into session. And a supplemental will probably be around 15 million just to finish funding them for this year. Uh, with the change of, I think, two areas. One is the pandemic. A lot of the courts have been shut down. And so, therefore, they've not been operating. So the fees and fines have not been charged. And uh, while it is, and I would agree, not a good way to fund the courts, uh, but right now that's how we are doing it. We've got to work our way out of it. Uh, we're also seeing in eastern Oklahoma, and I'd be interested in, in uh, Madam Secretary uh, Branson Thomas's comments on this as well. Uh, we've had a lot of tribal citizens uh, with cases that have either been dismissed. Some of those have gone on to the feds and uh, they have certainly uh, done a great job federally. We've had a lot of misdemeanors simply uh, dismissed out of the court. And so uh, if I look in just one area, and that's in Olfusky County, we've lost about $50,000 just simply uh, in our court fines and fees. And so uh, that's another area that we're having to work through the pandemic, plus in eastern Oklahoma with the, the, the McGirt case. On the pandemic infrastructure at OESC, uh, we are looking at it. I think uh, Director Zumwalt's doing a fantastic job. I mean, there's no doubt about it. I meet with her on a regular basis. Uh, before she ever arrived, we approved money. And this was whenever 
uh, about probably 2016, 2017 to update some of the infrastructure at OASC. This was federal money. And uh, that some of that money was used. And this is, again, before Director Zumwalt was there and uh, not being updated as it should have been. So we're looking into that. Uh, it is a priority of hers. It's a priority of ours that that is updated as soon as possible. Thank you, Senator. Um, uh, Secretary Branson Thompson. Sure. Thank you, Senator Thompson, for the question and for posing the issue. I think um, there are several other uh, countywide court systems that are in a similar situation in eastern Oklahoma. And until, you know, we can get to the table and have substantive discussions about how to resolve some of these issues, I think it's going to be a continued concern. Um, the nation has made investments to expand our internal court system to be able to process some of those misdemeanors um, for those that are that now fall under the McGirt decision. Um, and we, we we face the same challenges as the state of Oklahoma does in funding our court system. We have to have a way um, in order to generate revenue to provide support for those services. And so while there has been a loss, I think um, we've taken on additional responsibilities um, and have similar code to the state of Oklahoma. Actually, one of the first efforts um, that the nation undertook was to update um, our traffic code and our uh, criminal code uh, to better reflect the state of Oklahoma so that we do not abridge any um, right uh, of our tribal citizens that they have possessed as an Oklahoma citizen. And so it is a challenge, I think, um, working out some of the disagreements um, and jurisdictional challenges uh, is critical. Some counties have been uh, more, more open to that than others. Um, but these are some residual impacts. Uh, we're really only about six months out from the decision and um, making changes during the pandemic has been challenging because it really affects the way that we communicate um, and come together as communities to make these decisions. So um, we're definitely looking forward um, to any solutions or options uh, and looking forward to some of those discussions with you and others uh, during the legislative session. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Um, I'm going to pause to see if Representative Munson uh, wants to jump in. We're counting for that lag, and I'm dealing with it by just asking her and then sitting in silence. It's like a transatlantic phone call. Carly, I I didn't hear what you said. I'm sorry. Uh, it's it's all right. Um, the <laughs> oh goodness, what was the question? <laughs> um, Secretary Branson, what did we talk about? Secretary uh, Branson Thomas, you want to help me out with what the question was? Uh, I think the initial question was that. Um, that uh, fees and fines um, and some of the shortages that uh, judicial systems are experiencing. Uh, and then Senator Thompson asked about some of the changes as a result of the McGirt decision. Tell you what, we are going to jump on um, in a lot of our spending for today, uh, corrections, for example, um, we know comes from underspending on preventive measures in the past, in some cases, substantially in the past. Is there a way for us to turn around our priorities so that we can be spending more on prevention now and less on treatment in the future? Representative Munson, are you jumping in there or do you want to? I'll start and then maybe Munson will, Munson will know what we're talking about in a second. Um, I just want to jump in because I've been in the middle of um, the budget <laughs> hearings that the legislature does for health and human services. So hearing from health related agencies and human service agencies. And I mean, the theme across all those is prevention, the need for prevention and the cost of crisis. Our state pays a premium for crisis. We've seen it, of course, in healthcare care um, because of emergency room visits. We see it in um, helping individuals uh, who are caregivers for people with disabilities. 
Um, you know, when those caregivers age or are in crisis, we end up paying for um, help for their loved one um, that costs way more than a type of preventative services when we can keep people in communities. Uh, as we try to turn that corner, we have to invest upfront. And when we get opportunities to increase budgets, we have to increase upfront um, for prevention and invest in that across all areas. Okay, I think I'm back on. There we go. I'm wondering if this is AT&T's way of trying to get me to update my Wi-Fi. Um, <laughs> I uh, just thank you for your patience is what I first thing I want to say. Um, you know, something in the last few years that we have all been talking about, um, I think, uh, you know, across the board, across party line, across the chamber, um, our chambers is um, adverse experiences. And it, and it seems to be that more and more legislators are starting to really understand their uh, power and impacting policy when it comes to um, helping children early on. And and what I, when I am asked to talk about childhood trauma and ACEs in particular, I always explain that um, what we see in Oklahoma with our um, average ACE score of, of our children here in the state um, is it's really a blueprint of where we uh, must invest especially when it comes to prevention. Um, we always um, spout our statistics around incarceration, around healthcare, around education to make a point on um, just kind of where we're at as a state. But we also have to remember that those are lives being impacted, especially children who will ultimately become adults who will need services um, that are more expensive like mental health care, behavioral health care, um, their health care, uh, just general health care will be more expensive. Uh, their opportunities for employment will be or have the the possibility to be um, uh, they won't have as many options as as those who have access to early childhood education services and and quality public education in their communities um, and health care and getting regular checkups and so um, while those statistics are um, they are important. We have to remember they're more than numbers. They really tell us a story about what our families are facing, what our children are facing. Um, and I often share my own life experience and how grateful I am for counselors and teachers and other community members who were really safeguards for me um, to be where I am today. And so um, we really have to do better with um, prevention and investing in those services that we know are so critical. And one in particular that I'm working on this session is restoring funding for Heartline 211. Um, that's a service that, that serves Oklahomans across the state when it comes to anything and everything, but especially when, when someone is facing a mental health crisis um, and everything that we're dealing with with the pandemic and the vaccine rollout. And then here in central Oklahoma, um, specifically in the metro area here in Oklahoma City, that recent ice storm that really impacted families that continue to traumatized folks and um, who are still finding relief. 211 was there, uh, but we still aren't adequately funding the 211 line. And those are pieces of the budget that you really have to delve into the details um, and not just get stuck up stuck on the broader uh, budget when it comes to agencies or um, the, the bigger budget as a whole. And so, um, that takes all of us as as legislators to really dig in and 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 start to piece together and see that um, the decisions that we make and where we're funding and where we're making cuts and where we're making investments um, and how they they play out in the long run. Let's go to Secretary uh, Branson Thomas. Yes, I just wanted to say one quick thing that um, prevention and some of the federal um, grants that come out from uh, in these areas around mental health specifically and healthcare directly, um, these are actually joint opportunities where tribes and st the state could actually work together to leverage funding that we both receive. So some of these funds, um, we both get similar types or we're competing against each other for funding. Um, and I think I'd love to see the legislator um, encourage the um, administration to work more closely on some of those joint issues, particularly coming from SAMHSA or from HRSA, where um, sometimes tribes are one of the only, if not the only uh, provider of healthcare. Um, and 
you know, we're competing against each other when we really could be working together to build a more seamless network, um, particularly around mental health. So I hope that there's an opportunity as we move forward and those new opportunities come out from the federal government that the state and tribes can work together in our in our smaller rural areas where perhaps the state struggles, um, you know, to build a network there and the tribes already has a presence um, and being able to expand to non-beneficiaries or non-Indians um, would be an opportunity both for us to grow in service, but um, to to kind of build a patchwork across the state. So there's some missed opportunities there as well. Uh, and Senator Thompson, uh, anything else you'd like to add there? Yes, I would. Uh, thank you, Madam Secretary. I look forward to uh, working very closely. Uh, I think a lot of that is going to be information for us to be able to share and uh, maybe um, would improve outcomes a great deal. I am very, very interested in improving outcomes. And uh, a lot of this uh, keep going through the court system or going through the corrections or wherever, we've got to get up front. And uh, you, the Muscogee Creek Nation, uh, your chief, Chief Hill, uh, members have been great partners with us in healthcare and uh, great partners with us throughout. And uh, now in this new era of uh, McGirt, um, I wanna look for every avenue that we can work together for better outcomes for all Oklahoma. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Senator Thompson. It's something that I used to keep in mind, still do, when looking at, for instance, the uh, healthcare authority budget, which is, as you know, massive, um, was looking at those staggering numbers and thinking that's nebulizers, that's insulin, that's a um, mental health check, that's there's so much um, that people rely on every day that comes out of, that comes out of those programs. Um, I'd like us to go um, for wrap up to uh, one more question um which is and which i have just lost which is fantastic um we have a lot of people on this panel um expressing that they are budget nerds yep, culpa. um but the question asker says i worry about my students and families not being able to understand the complexities of the budget process and at the end of the day this is their money um how can as a lawmaker what's your opinion on the transparency of the budget process and i think people's question is how do we help people understand what's happening um, I would also be remiss if I didn't put a shameless plug in for OK Policy's uh, uh, online budget guide, um, which Paul Shin updates pretty regularly. It's like painting the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, but all that aside, uh, legislators, uh, Secretary Branson Thomas, how do we make this process more transparent? Uh, I'll start. And, um, you know, I hear a lot about that. And even before that, I was. Um, budget chair and appropriations chair you know we hear about smoke filled rooms where deals are made i'm, I'm yet to be in that room uh, if it's out there i'd like to know uh we start out uh with the uh, the budget process of the board of equalization december number we'll build a budget off of the uh, february number uh, on the senate side uh, right now we're having hearings and uh, many of those uh, uh, those hearings are live streamed uh, people can get involved in it today we're having one for uh, dlc it's going on right now while i'm on here and uh, so uh, we're trying on the Senate side to be as open and transparent as we can with the numbers. Uh, now, it comes down toward the end, there'll be bills that will be uh, debated. They'll pass during session. These will have a fiscal impact. And so we may have some different numbers that the legislators want. Uh, so uh, I'm happy to have those discussions. Uh, one thing very quickly, I know we're about out of time. I host in my office uh, probably before the pandemic, probably three to four classes a year, that they will bring either their high school finance class or their math class. They'll come to my office and uh, I'll spend anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour with them answering questions and going over the budget and being a part of their learning process and happy to do that. I'll just add that um, uh, there's only a few people that have a handle on the entire budget um, and uh, they've had years to learn. So uh, individuals don't need to have an understanding of the entire budget to speak up about what's important. I think you have to keep holding us accountable on what meaningful transparency is to you. Um, Senator Thompson has a weekly budget breakdown that gives some details in different areas. Feedback to those, feedback to your legislator, require them to get more involved. Um, the people have to say what they, what they wanna hear and what they wanna know. And I think if you speak up and say you want to see more in advance of the budget's passing, then then that's what will happen. Um, but it's up to you to tell us um, how you expect us to govern, frankly, and hold us accountable for it. Um, and I think Oklahoma Policy Institute will help you do that. Um, 
but throughout the process, ask every question you have. I found that any question I ask in committee meetings, um, it's probably representative of many, many more questions that are that are out there and that need to be answered. And we have to be willing to ask the hard questions. Um, we sometimes I think we we want to forget in the name of harmony that this is a negotiated and contested area. We have to debate. We have to disagree. We have to uh, struggle over what those priorities are. And that's not always going to be rosy, um, but we're still colleagues and we're still working together to get things done. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Kurt. Um, we will jump over to Representative Munson. Yeah, I just can't emphasize enough how important lived experience is to the work that we do. Um, what Senator Kurt was saying, every question that we ask, um, it may come from our own individual research and, and the work that we're doing, but it's usually rooted in what we're hearing out in our community, whether when we're knocking doors or our constituents who are calling um, and asking questions. Um, I think one thing that this pandemic, um, you know, it's, it's highlighted a lot of things, but so many folks were calling my office and sharing their personal stories and they would just break down and, and apologize for that, which they didn't have to do. Um, but, but they became more open to talking to me about their struggles, um, not just because of the pandemic and how it's impacted their, their employment or their, their health or their families and their lives, but really starting to open up a little bit more about um, other struggles that fa they face or other questions that they had about the work that I do. And so, you know, when we're out campaigning and, and knocking doors and asking you to communicate with us, um, especially educators, I think it is important to educate your students and educate your families on how to contact us uh, by email or by phone and finding ways to um, get more comfortable in talking to your elected officials. We are human beings. Um, my Wi-Fi is, is just as bad as, you know, everyone else's Wi-Fi and, and we're figuring life out. And at the end of the day, our job is to be the voice of the people, regardless of what party we're in, regardless of what chamber we're in or what leadership position we hold every day. Our job is to bring those lived experiences to the Capitol. And so there, there's no need to feel like you're an expert on any one policy matter or, uh, a budget nerd. Um, what's most important is your lived experience and and the impacts that our decisions make on you. And um, I just cannot stress that enough. And I can't wait until we are away from this pandemic and we can have face to face conversations because there's nothing I love more than when folks call and just ask to have coffee or lunch. Um, and I certainly recognize that that can come from a privileged position. Um, and so I do try my best to reach out to my district. Um, so when they become more familiar with me, they feel more comfortable asking those questions. Um, so if you're watching this, listening or coming back and watching this later, just know you don't have to be an expert to care or to speak up. Um, all you have to do is, is share what it is that you're living through. Representative Bunsen, uh, the line that I use when I'm talking with advocates is the question is not, do you know who your legislators are? The question is, do your legislators know who you are? Um, and I'm thinking we should have a reunion of this panel um, back uh, after session, because I know we're all going into the busiest time of the year for all of us. So I'm thinking um, in June, once we've had a chance to sleep for a bit, like a week, um, we'll be able to get together and talk again about the importance of advocacy um, when you all have the chance to be in the district um, of making sure that those connections are being made and that um, advocates are, are talking to legislators about what they care about. Um, I know uh, Representative Munson, you said you got one call about a vote on a budget. Um, and often legislators make those decisions based on who's contacting them and what they're hearing from, from the people who live and work in their districts. So making sure that local um, Oklahomans are building those relationships and making, those voices, making their voices heard is just absolutely crucial. Um, this also brings us to the end of our panel. Um, thank you so much um, to all of our panelists for taking uh, time to share their thoughts and their insights um, as we go into the legislative session. Um, thanks also for dealing with any tech hiccups we may have had before or during this call. Um, and thanks to our audience for asking such great questions.